Our first speaker is uh, Carol Stoker. Uh, Carol Stoker is not only a founding member of the Mars Society, she's a founding member of the Mars Underground that preceded the Mars Society. Uh, she's one of those uh, few, the proud, uh, we few, we very few, we band of brothers and sisters uh, that started the Mars Underground back in 1981 with Chris McKay and Penelope Boston. And I heard about them a couple of years later and then came on board. And uh, that eventually led to, uh, well, th their conferences, in fact, were called The Case for Mars, which is from what, where I got the title of my book. Um, and. Um, and then eventually the Mars Society. Um, and Carol has been into human Mars mission design. She's been into astrobiology. She's been into Mars analog work. She's been into Mars drilling. Uh, she's been into grabbing the microphone from me when I ran over time. Uh, the, uh, uh, but in any case, she's great. Here's Carol Stoker. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you about uh, Search for Life on Mars uh, and uh, why it's relevant for human exploration. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> oh, I clicked them, okay. Huh. <clears throat> you might have seen this. Um, this is uh, showed up in uh, October 10th in Scientific American uh, blog, actually it's a blog, I'm convinced we found evidence of life on Mars in the 1970s. This was written by Gil Levin, who was the PI of one of the Viking biology experiments. Um, <clears throat> so there's been a little bit of press buzz about this to the extent that you can get press buzz about anything that isn't related to what's going on <laughs> in Washington. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, the Viking mission was the uh, first landed mission to Mars, the first successful landed mission to Mars in 1976. And it's the only mission to this day to ever search for life on another planet. They claim they're doing it, but this is the only mission that actually did it. Uh, this is the young Carl Sagan standing in front of the Viking lander. There were two identical landers. They uh, put one at mid-latitudes and one at a high latitude. Um, <clears throat> the high latitude was chosen because they thought there might be access to ice. There were three life detection instruments. The mission was focused on life detection and there was an organic analysis instrument, very similar to an instrument that's on the Curiosity rover, the SAM instrument. Um, and there was a robotic arm that scooped soil into the instruments. Um, the uh, <coughs> The design of the instruments was based on looking for evidence <coughs> of metabolism. So you would have had to have awake uh, micro microbes that you could culture. Um, <coughs> so basically so a soil sample was put into this, um, through this funnel and then it went to each of three instruments. Um, <coughs> the uh, results were kind of un unexpected. It was, in fact, in many ways consistent with their pre-planned um, protocol for how you would detect microbes. Uh, the soil was very reactive, and the reactions were somewhat like Earth life would produce, but they were different in detail. In particular, they were kind of explosive. The reaction happened very quickly, and then it went to um, sort of ran out of uh, this in, in what's called its exponential phase, very fast, like within two days. But one of the instruments, which was the labeled release instrument, uh, <coughs> results were fully consistent with biology. The other two instruments were considered not to be consistent because they did a step where they took the soil sample and then uh, heat sterilized it, essentially heated it up, and then ran it through the instruments again. And these two instruments still showed a reaction, but this one did not. So it was fully consistent with biology according to the protocol that had been laid out in advance. Uh, however, this fourth instrument, which was not a biology instrument per se, showed there were no organics in the soil. And this was thought to be a showstopper. If there's no organics, then 
these can't be biological reactions. <coughs> so for 32 years, we went along thinking there were no organics in Martian soil, not even as many as meteorites would put into Martian soil. A after 32 years, another experiment was performed that showed that there is peroxide in the soil and that peroxide would actually have oxidized organics in that instrument <coughs> uh, during the heating stage. So the way the instrument works is you heat the sample up and you give off the volatiles and then they are uh, analyzed with a mass spectrometer. But no organics were seen. Um, <coughs> so in 2008, there was the Phoenix mission. It landed at 68 degrees north uh, on ice-rich terrain. It was really there to look for, um, to study the ice, to study the polar regions. But it also contained a similar instrument to the instrument that was on uh, Viking. So the mission objectives were to search for a habitable environment, to search for the presence of organic carbon, and to measure the chemistry of the Martian soil. And a discovery, and it was quite a surprise, was that there is a very uh, high concentration of this weird chemical perchlorate. Here's its chemical formula. Uh, and it's at like concentrations of about 1% of the soil. Well, why is perchlorate important? First of all, it's fuel. It burned or could burn organic carbon. If you had organic carbon in the soil and you put it into an instrument that heats the soil up, it will combust with the organic carbon and produce CO2. And that's in fact what the GCMS on Viking detected was it detected carbon dioxide coming off, but nothing else. Um, <coughs> it's also <coughs> food. Turns out many microorganisms can use this for metabolism. And finally, it's antifreeze. <laughs> it can lower the freezing point of water to typical temperatures experienced in the Mars polar regions today. Uh, unfortunately, I made my slides go right to the bottom, so <laughs> maybe you're cut off by the table here. Um, anyway, so the, the Phoenix uh, mission, it turns out I was the head of the biological potential science working group for the mission, and uh, Phoenix found habitable conditions in the Mars high-latitude high ice, uh, but not today. Habitable conditions in the past, but the recent past. So um, basically the, those conditions were that there was evidence for liquid water. The very first place we dug into the soil with the robotic arm, uh, we found white ice, different from the soil, and that is produced, we think, by a freeze-thaw process. It's called segregated ice. Um, <coughs> We, for, we found calcite, uh, a mineral that's only formed in the presence of liquid water, and we found patchiness in the perchlorate signature. This is uh, spectrally patchiness, uh, which suggested water was mobilizing it. And since perchlorate is extremely soluble in water, uh, <coughs> it wouldn't be surprised that it would get moved around. Um, <coughs> As I mentioned, perchlorate is a biologically available energy source. If you want to live on Mars, you actually have to live in the subsurface because, well, people won't have to, but <laughs> uh, microbes have to because the ultraviolet light is uh, sterilizing. But you don't need to go very deep under the surface. There are transparent particles in the soil that you could actually crawl right under. <coughs> <coughs> microbes are small. These are uh, millimeter-sized transparent particles. Um, <clears throat> the chemical environment is otherwise very benign, and what this shows is all the different uh, types of things that could be in the soil that would uh, mat match with the perchlorate <clears throat> and um, allow you to make a living, essentially. Um, so if you were subsurface. So we concluded that the icy soils in the northern polar region are habitable in modern times. Um, the whole northern hemisphere of Mars is at low elevation, and because it's at low elevation, low enough elevation, uh, the pressure is high enough for liquid water to occur. 
In the entire southern hemisphere, it is not. Liquid water, pure liquid water, cannot occur in the southern hemisphere at all, just because of the pressure constraint. Um, the, uh, there's ice, there's water available. Uh, currently, the obliquity of Mars is low. It's, it's actually very similar to the obliquity of the Earth. But over time, the obliquity actually changes, and it changes dramatically. It actually changes from zero to 90 degrees. The whole planet flips over, you know, it's, it's pretty am amazing. But at high obliquity, the North Polar region is warm enough for that ground ice to melt to a depth of one meter. And that happens actually pretty fast. It, the high obliquity, this is actually a graph of the obliquity variations. As you can see, if you can see under the table, <laughs> uh, it's going up and down very rapidly. I have another slide about this later. But <clears throat> anyway, this has been the inspiration for a mission that we've been proposing to Discovery for three rounds now. Um, so literally like the last uh, 10 years of my life, I've been trying to get this mission flown. I would have been better off starting my own space company, honestly, <laughs> you know, than trying to actually win a proposal to fly a NASA mission to Mars. Um, anyway, we just submitted our proposal in June. Um, we are awaiting the results. The PI of this mission is Chris McKay. The spacecraft is provided by Lockheed Martin. And it's the same lander, uses the same lander as Phoenix and InSight, uh, has a one meter drill and uh, two life detection instruments and a habitability assessment instrument. Um, so let's get back to this climate model thing. This is a, a graph that shows uh, <coughs> where, what the number of days are per year that a, <coughs> per Mars year, that liquid water can occur, just thermodynamically, pure liquid water at the surface. And uh, this is some modeling by uh, Richardson and Mishnah, 2005. Nobody's been looking at this recently, and, I, and that's a problem, I think. <coughs> um, but anyway, what you see is that up here where Phoenix was, which is actually up here, um, there are no days that you can get liquid water. They're all, but there are many days in the, uh, low latitudes to mid latitudes that you can get liquid water up to like uh, in this area like uh, <clears throat> two to three hundred days a year. That's a lot. Um, so here is what it looks like at high obliquity. So at a 45 degree obliquity which last occurred six million years ago um, and this is the latitude that the Phoenix landing site was at there were between 20 and 50 days a year that liquid water, pure liquid water could occur. So that, again, is kind of the logic behind the icebreaker mission is go back to the Phoenix landing site and sample, uh, again, for um, organic molecules and, um, <coughs> and search for actual biosignatures of life. So here's the kind of a blow up again of the obliquity in the last 10 million years. It's uh, going back in time to the right. We're here, here's where we are right now. And as you go back in time, you get to these much higher obliquities. And this uh, solid line here, this is where you start to get substantial melting down to tens of centimeters in the subsurface. So um, the average obliquity, it turns out, is more like 40 degrees. We just happen to be in a really bad period on Mars right now. Um, so by drilling to one meter, we can get and analyze samples that represent the entire range of these potentially habitable conditions. Um, and here's a picture of <coughs> the icebreaker drill, which is a one meter drill. Um, so as I said, icebreaker uses the same lander as Phoenix and InSight and goes to the well-characterized Phoenix landing site Partly that is for cost reasons, um, because we don't have to do landing site certification. And Discovery, the program we're trying to get into, is a very cost constrained program. So uh, the site we know has proven near surface ice. It's rock free and it's flat. So it's a very safe place to land a, um, 
a simple three-legged lander. <laughs> this is not a rover, it's just a lander. Um, and it's a solar-powered lander. So uh, it has these two life detection instruments, again, the one-meter drill, and uh, cameras that are uh, really devoted just to operating the, the, uh, the lander. It's, they're not really focused on um, doing a more uh, sophisticated geology kind of mission. We leave those to JPL. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the sampling system is a rotary percussive drill from Honeybee Robotics. We have been testing this drill in the Atacama Desert for the last three years, mounted on a rover, going into all kinds of different soils, including uh, cemented soils that are actually cemented by salt, by halite. In fact, this is in a field of cemented halite. Um, and so we've been essentially bringing the TRL up and testing this drill. Um, and it uh, works quite well. We also have a robotic arm very similar to the robotic arm that was on Phoenix. And it hands off the sample to the drill using this little mechanism right here. The the sample comes up, the auger flights is scraped off by this, kind of looks like a bicycle sprocket, and they fall into the scoop, which then delivers them to the instruments. Um, so what do we want? Life. Do we care if it's dead or alive? No. <laughs> In fact, uh, search for life is really best, not a search for something alive. And that was actually the Viking problem. Um, they were metabolism experiments. Metabolism experiments only work if you got something alive right now. And in fact, in most extreme environments, you cannot culture like 80% of the organisms that are in that environment. Um, and so we were trying to go to Mars, a completely alien environment, and very extreme, and try to culture them with what was effectively chicken soup. Um, so at the scale of microorganisms, shape is not convincing. So what you really need to do is look for biosignature molecules. So Icebreaker's approach is to look at, um, with a GCMS kind of instrument, uh, look at the uh, lipids and their uh, distribution, to look at amino acids and their distribution and their handedness. Turns out life picks one particular orientation of amino acids. And the other, which is the mirror image of it, it doesn't use. And we would expect that to always be true because you can't make the complex peptides with a mixture. Um, so this would be the strategy for searching for life with, with the instrument that is a Viking-like instrument, except that we have added a feature that will extract the organic compounds prior to heating them up. So that's a chemical extraction process so that we don't uh, oxidize them by the perchlorate. Uh, we also have an instrument that we've been collaborating with the Center for Astrobiology in Spain for many years. This is a, uh, called the, si the Signs of Life Detector, solid. And it's a very solid instrument. I mean, they always show up. They, we've had this in the Atacama for four years. They always are able to do sample analysis, and they are always able to get results. You can't say that about very many flight instruments. Uh, basically, it's based on immunoassay, which is the same kind of technique that you use when you get a blood test for almost anything. Um, <clears throat> so it's a very well-known pharmaceutical technique. It's never been flown before. But it's basically growing up antibodies to the compounds you want to detect, <clears throat> and then uh, printing those antibodies onto an array, and then you put the sample in, you mix it with water, you shake it, and then you uh, let it sit on that array for a long, like a, an hour. And it, the, uh, if the compounds are there, they react with the antibodies, they bind with the antibodies, and then you can detect them because they give off fluorochromes, and you look at them with the camera. Um, so. This is all nice. We hope we win. What has it got to do with human missions to Mars? <laughs> well, human missions or any missions to Mars are actually governed by this thing called the Outer Space Treaty. And the treaty states that 
the parties um, to the treaty will pursue studies of outer space, including the moon and other bodies, and conduct exploration so as to avoid their harmful contamination and also adverse changes in the environment of the Earth resulting from the introduction of extraterrestrial material. So this is the basis for the Coast Bar regulations on planetary protection. Sample return from Mars is restricted. It is restricted even for robotic missions. And human return from Mars would be restricted. And it would be a restricted sample return. This is not um, something you get just advisory. This is, has the force of federal law and applies to SpaceX as well as anyone else. Uh, so by the uh, Constitution, essentially. So why, <laughs> what is the issue? <laughs> uh, humans and materials returning from Mars pose a risk to Earth. And that risk needs to be evaluated realistically with data. Now maybe it isn't just, you know, big green creatures are going to kill the president like they did in Mars Attacks, the movie. <laughs> Um, and this was, in fact, a female creature in Mars Attacks. Um, <coughs> but uh, microbial contamination of Earth is itself very dangerous. Now, it has been argued, in fact, I believe by Robert Zubrin, that it's low risk because Martian materials capable of hosting viable microbes arrive on Earth at an average rate of 10 kilograms per year. And they've been doing that for all of geologic time. So Earth may already be contaminated by Mars life. Um, there's a counter argument, which is the way engineers think, which is that maybe it's low risk, but it's a very high consequence. If contamination of Earth by a competitive alien species, it could be very bad. Um, so there are numerous examples of imported alien species on Earth, you know, the, the uh, snail darter, you know, I mean, there's just lots and lots of those which uh, would lead to caution in this regard. Um, why am I not? OK. So here's another issue. Um, this is a map showing where all the ground ice features are, uh, essentially glacial features, are on Mars. So Mars has ground ice. It's like a third of the surface of Mars has ground ice. And human missions would really like to use that ground ice for uh, living off the land, fuels, breathable air, water to drink, grow plants, etc. Um, and not only that, but in many places, as as um, high of latitude or low of latitude as 39 degrees, this ground ice is very close to the surface. And the ones we know about that are very close to the surface surface are because. Um, Meteors hit the surface and uh, excavate the ice, and the high-rise imager has actually discovered these as they occur. And the, the lowest latitude one they have found is actually at 39 degrees. And the depth of these, the depth of the white ice that's being excavated, is uh, only less than a meter. Well, let's go back to this particular picture, which is this is current obliquity, right? This is hundreds of days a year where, this is 39, by the way, this, <laughs> this red line here, hundreds of days a year that liquid water can occur at the surface of Mars. And this has not been modeled, but I believe that if once I ever convince anybody to do this modeling, that as you go down into the subsurface, you will see that at current obliquity, uh, you can have melting down to a meter in the mid-latitude ice. Should, it makes sense, you know, because it's based on models from, uh, uh, from the Phoenix Landing Site area. So another issue is that the samples collected by the Mars 2020 rover are very unlikely to provide us any useful information. For one thing, the proposed landing site is deliberately away from special regions, that is, regions where viable biology can occur. And secondly, it collects samples of ancient rocks, hope to contain fossils of ancient rocks, of ancient life. And then it, can't, it puts those samples in little tubes, and it scatters them on the surface. 
It doesn't even keep them on board. It just leaves them on the surface for some future mission to go pick them up and bring them back to Earth. And that future mission has not been selected or planned. I guess they maybe have a plan, but there is no uh, funded future mission to go pick those samples up. And to some extent, they're relying on interest in the samples to be the thing that drives that future mission. Well, all this could take a very long time, right? And by the way, icebreaker doesn't happen soon enough. Icebreaker, because of the particular opportunity we had to propose for this time, uh, won't get to Mars until 2029. So uh, we propose that we use icebreaker as a essentially an entry to a biosafe on Mars. This would be a, a concept mission for life detection at a human, human landing site as part of site certification. The idea is that we collect samples with the rover carrying a drill. Um, we do this uh, sensitive detection of amino acids and lipids in larger biomolecules, and we do a chemical characterization. And should there be a detection of only meteoritic amino acids and no evidence of biomolecules, then that would be an adequate evidence for uh, biological safety. So in conclusion, this is what Carl Sagan says from the grave. It's been 43 years since Viking. Isn't it time we resume the search for life on Mars? <laughs> so uh, prior to sending humans, we should perform a search for extant life on Mars in the chosen human landing site. And results will provide a new understanding of the potential for life on Mars, lower the potential risk of human exploration, and if biosignatures are found, we could get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Does that work now? Um, so it seems like um, determining that there's life on Mars or on any planet is kind of black and white. If, if there is, there is. But then if there's not, it's more difficult to prove conclusively that there's not, especially based on what we found about life in extreme environments here on Earth. At what point do we say that there's not life on Mars and move forward still protecting the possibility that we could find life in extreme environments? So um, as you can imagine, this is a, a controversial topic. There's uh, a push now from um, the MEPAG, which is Mars Exploration Payload Analysis Group. Uh, this is sort of the scientific community um, that is the scientific community supporting Mars exploration. and. Um, they're actually pushing for relaxing the planetary protection requirements because we haven't found any uh, what they call special regions uh, at the present time. Um, again, I think there's very likely to be pushback, um, but the, the planning for human exploration that's being done by NASA is really um, kind of relying on that Viking proved there was no life on Mars. <laughs> And so I think we're in, we're actually kind of in the other extreme. Uh, you're worried about, you know, how do we prove there is no life on Mars? Well, I think we need to do, we have done one experiment in the 1970s. We know a lot about biology we didn't know then. Um, so if anything, we are remiss in not being a little more careful. Okay. Uh, I think this is an absolutely terrific mission, and I hope you win it. Um, but I think the rationale you're currently offering for the mission is uh, off the wall. Um, because we don't send a life detection experiment to Mars in order to say that's not where we should send people, okay? 
if we were to detect life on Mars, that is exactly where we should send people. The purpose of robotic exploration is to be able to target the more effective human explorers at the most interesting places, not to ban people from the most interesting places. There's things that human scientists could do on a scene that was uh, scientifically interesting, that it had life in it, that are, are uh, an endless suite of, of, of experiments beyond what the icebreaker itself can do. So, look, the precautionary principle can be used to prevent any activity, okay? For example, digging a hole on Earth, you can recover sediments from the past which do contain disease organisms from uh, 100 years ago, 500 years ago, a million, black death, okay? Uh, it's all there. The idea of pathogens on Mars is fantastical, and, uh, but if you detected uh, life that's where we should send people. The, and, and furthermore, as far as certifying that Mars is safe because you didn't detect life, the precautionists will simply say, well, you didn't detect life there, it could be there. Okay, um, you know, uh, there are lions I, I think on that's Earth enough that you, of a question. Robert. All right, go to. <laughs> there she is, cutting me off again. Let's see, right. yeah. <laughs> There's his comment. I'll let it stand. Can we get the next question? All right. <laughs> supposing, uh, <clears throat> supposing we do find life on Mars, and let's say it's 50 years in the future, and we actually establish something like the South Pole Station, where a biologist could actually go and actually not die immediately and, and survive reasonably comfortably and do research, how much of demand do you think there would be among biologists to actually go out there and do research? And question part two of it is what sort of facilities would you need in terms of being able to transport around the planet being able to get machine shops to build you special rigs to do the necessary excavation and things like that so the new uh, piece of information that's come out in the last like six months or year has been um, the discovery of a liquid water um, lake under the south pole of Mars uh, at a uh, depth of like a kilometer, which is actually more shallow than um, the liquid water under the surface of Europa, which is now a target of exploration to search for life. Um, <clears throat> it really depends. I mean, what what I'm referring what I'm referring to as a biosafe is it's really a question of does it pose risk to Earth? If there's not if there's no life there around the human landing site, if you can certify the human landing site at down to a depth that you're going to uh, be, you know, disturbing the subsurface is, has no uh, indication of biology, then go ahead and go there. If you do see an indication of biology, then I think you really are in a position where you've got to understand, is that going to be a risk to Earth? And whether Robert thinks it's a risk to Earth or not is not what's important. It has the force of law. It is a, um, now you maybe can change the law, but it is in fact part of a treaty. So um, as far as, you know, what all do you need? Well, it, again, it depends on is it something that you need to uh, uh, be concerned that there is a, a risk to interaction with the astronauts or not. But, but in general, what you do to study any extreme environment on Earth is you use very clean technique. You sterilize everything, you use gloves, you use clean room suits, you use masks. In the case of Mars, that would be a spacesuit. <laughs> right? uh, you want a pretty leak-proof spacesuit. Um, and you do your studies under, uh, in a glove box and in a contained environment. But it's not, it's not a huge uh, additional effort because you're, you're, the way you have to live on Mars is not like you're walking around in shirt sleeves anyway. So everything kind of has to be isolated from everything else. From what we know now, how far down do we think the perchlorate concentration goes? Like in the lakes, a thousand meters down, do we think there's perchlorates in the soil around those liquid water deposits? And related to that, if you could go down five or ten meters instead of one meter with your drill, do you think you'd find something substantially different than in the top meter layer of the soil? Well, um, 
There's two, that's two questions. So we actually don't know what the source of the perchlorate is. Um, there's one uh, theory that is that it's basically a photochemical product. Um, so it's photochemically produced from volcanism um, or molecules are thrown into the uh, atmosphere and then get photochemically converted into per perchlorate. So it's chlorine, oxygen, and uh, hydrogens that, and, and a, a cation, a magnesium or calcium. Um, it's, that's pr the, probably the most likely situation. So in that case, they probably don't go deep into the subsurface. Um, the, uh, the liquid water that's discovered at the South Polar region is probably, um, has been isolated for, you know, very, very long time. Um, and, you know, long time meaning probably billions of years. Um, <clears throat> there was a uh, couple of papers that were looking at perchlorate as having a role in um, essentially lubricating glacier, glacial flow that is in the northern hemisphere. So it's possible that it does get actually subsurface, but we don't know.